Previously on Project Odyssey. Computer, activate Tedris remote camera, target Mun. Krantz, I don't have any life support other than my suit. Good night, Hadfield. Good night, Hadfield. We'll need to refine the search parameters to narrow down which ones might bring more friends. We're running out of fuel and have no way of replacing it. I'm afraid not. We need to begin replenishing our fuel supplies immediately. We can use it here, on Minmus, on Duna, or anywhere you want. Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Kerbal Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number eight of Project Odyssey. And I am here trying to launch a solid rocket booster, lower stage propelled new station module. We have our station up in orbit, but oh, look at that flame. That is horrible. It's so tiny. So I've scaled up this booster, and my plan is that I'll be using this to get this up here. Oh, that's a much bigger flame. So I'm experimenting. I want to use a solid rocket booster for this lower stage of this launcher and get this new module up to the Odyssey station. Now that's looking pretty wide. The first one was very narrow. We're doing lots of simulations here. So I try to make it bigger again. <laughs> okay. That's quite a bit of flame on that one. I think maybe I overdid it. Well, maybe there's no such thing as overdoing it on a Kerbal launch, but still, let's try to get down into a slightly more reasonable launch. Well, not launch. I guess what I'm trying to say is launcher. Let's get into a more reasonable launcher. Maybe one where the flames are a little bit more in line with how big that booster is. Have the flames actually sit down below the booster just a little bit. However, on these simulations, we should still try everything. We're going to try decoupling it and opening up the fairing and powering it up a little before we revert, make any changes, and try again. Because I'm using the Hot Rockets mod, and I'm making modifications to the Hot rockets config files trying to get myself a really good uh, booster flame with the right size and the right position right you know, le uh, length and diameter of it that one is sitting up inside the engine still too much and it's not quite as long as what I'm looking for so this is another simulation where we just go straight up we decouple it we open up the fairing and then we go back down and we try it again and this went on a bunch of times I did this probably 20, 30 different times before I finally got smart and actually tried putting a whole bunch of boosters and a whole bunch of different configurations of boosters out on the launch pad at exactly the same time. But at this part in the project, you can see I haven't smartened up yet. I'm just doing a change and then reloading the game and going out on the pad and just trying one launch and seeing how it looks. I tried all different sizes, including this one that is probably at least twice the length of the actual launcher itself. Look at the size of that flame. Oh, man. That is very Kerbal. I was uh, making little adjustments like getting the flame to actually appear down below the engine properly. So here, this is the one where I got the flames looking like they were coming out of the bottom of the booster, all right. And maybe I'm okay with the width of that flame. But when it goes really, really long like it was doing here, what would happen is uh, as I would rotate the rocket, the flames would stick out straight, but the smoke was coming from the bottom of the rocket. And so it would, here, watch this. It's going to make a little turn and then it's going to just look really silly with the flames and the smoke both coming out of the same place. It just, it seems like the smoke should come off the bottom of the flame to me. Nonetheless, while we're in the simulator here, we might as well try once again decoupling and popping open the fairing. And uh, this time actually seeing Jebediah has been running these simulations. So he's going to simulate getting out of the airlock because we don't want to get this thing docked up onto Odyssey Station and then find out that he can't actually get in and out. Like, you know, hatches obstructed or some message like that. That'd be horrible. So he plays around in the simulator for a while and then he hops back in uh, to the simulated airlock one last time to make sure that'll work and then he goes on to the next simulation test. In this one, I was thinking I was really close before I did the simulation and then I looked at it and what? That thing is tiny. What is going on with this? I swear I had the numbers set right. 
Well, not knowing what was going wrong, it finally occurred to me that if I'm going to be doing this over and over like this, it might be a lot quicker if I were simply to bring up a bunch of boosters at the same time and pick the one out of it that I like. So now I have eight copies of my solid booster that's 2.5 meters wide for underneath this launcher I'm trying to make. And each one of these is set with a different value for one of the parameters that lets me control what it's gonna look like with hot rockets. Although honestly, when I'm looking at this one, I'm not really seeing any difference. Do those look really different to you in any meaningful way? They didn't to me. There's, maybe there's a slight distance change on some of them. So I make another config file change and we bring it here and we do it again with a whole new set of eight boosters. And we fire them off a lot quicker this time because I'm realizing I'm not really seeing that much difference. Oh, but then at the end, that one is somehow much longer than the others. Even though the change in between it and the one before it was the same as the one before that. Like I incremented by 0.1 each time, but only the one on the end actually seemed to have any kind of difference. And now this whole process is going to start over and over again, where I make a 0.1 change to a particular variable going from left to right or bottom of the screen to the top of the screen each time. So like the length might get 0.1 longer than the one before it. You can sort of see it right there, how it's just getting slightly longer each time. And we can control things about the flames to see how wide they are, how long they are. We can control how fast they're moving. We can control the smoke. To be honest, a lot of this was just trial and error. I don't really know what most of the variables do. They have names that sort of make sense, like uh, one that says speed. Well, I kind of get the idea of that, of course. And one of them that tells me how big the things are going to expand. Uh, ultimately, though, I don't really know what the variables do. So I was just trying different things and seeing what it looked like it was changing. This very last one here is looking at the smoke changes. I've made different modifications to how the smoke's supposed to come out, and I wanted to see how it looked as it got further away. And once all that was done, it was time to bring it out and run it through its final simulated launches here, just to see how it goes when it's back on the actual launch pad like a real rocket should be. Except when I staged it, nothing happened. The booster says that it should be activated and it's a solid rocket booster and yet it didn't do anything. So I must have messed something up in one of the variables. So I bring it out for one more try and we fire it up here, hit the staging button, making sure that that's actually in the right stage. And once again, the solid rocket booster fails to actually ignite. It's a solid rocket booster. I don't need to throttle it up. It should just ignite. Oh. So I take it back into the VAB and back out this time because sometimes in the past I've had issues where if I revert to launch, it doesn't actually launch properly. If I revert to the vehicle assembly building and then launch, it does work correctly. So we give it a try here and we take a look at the flame and we see whether or not we like where that smoke is coming out and where the flame's coming out and is it thick enough, is it long enough? And again, it looks like when I go to actually launch it, something's not quite right. It was longer in the test. It was wider in the test. I don't know what keeps happening every time I switch in and out of the big test with the eight different rockets and then the one where I'm actually trying to launch it. Something's going on though, and I wasn't quite sure what. I started running my C-sharp builder, my, that program I'm working on, each time I was making a test now. So I'd run that and then I'd run KSP and give it a try and then run the C-sharp program again and try KSP and give it one more launch try, running the simulations over and over. And finally, I got this one that looked like maybe the flame was actually working fairly well this time. So knowing that our launch was imminent, I decided to finally add something I've been meaning to add for a while, and that is the hull camera mod, where it brings in some extra parts like this one you're seeing right here that looks sort of like a Hubble telescope. It's not very big relative to Kerbal's, but it's a decent sized telescope, and you can use that to make satellites. It also has various different cameras, like these uh, ones that you can usually would mount these underneath some airplanes or something, and then there that one is for boosters, this one is just like a security camera type of thing. Then there's ones that look like they're regular cameras that you might take like scuba diving or just regular cameras for vacation, take those out, whatever. So there's a variety of cameras and I figured I would get this and I would have it copy over that booster camera so that I can start putting it on the sides of my ships anytime I wanna see some booster style launch video. 
So finally I say to myself, this is going to be a real launch. And as you know, that now means that I will not be reverting and we're just going to see how it goes. Wouldn't you know it, of course. All the other times, everything was fine. On the one time that I say, now we're going to launch, it's raining and we had to scrub the launch and launch the next day instead. But the next day, the weather was clear, the sun was shining, even if it was still a little bit cloudy. So we, we, we were go for a launch, and this time we have our hull camera on the side there, so we can watch as that launch pad slips away underneath us and we rise into the heavens. You can see the size of the flame that I've ultimately decided to go with there. Uh, it was just too difficult to get it to be really long while also looking really cool. So I went for kind of a thick one full of flames, uh, but go for not super long. Whoa, what's going on? Uh, what? That's barely holding on there. Well, you know what? I think maybe what happened here is I might have been doing a test and then the simulation looked like it was going okay. So I did a revert to launch instead of revert to VAB. And like I said before, if you revert to launch, sometimes things don't get reloaded correctly right now. And uh, that stuff like what you just saw there can happen. But I somehow, I don't know how, I was able to keep it going in generally the right direction, except for the fact that after I decoupled, it was upside down. So, but you know, we're going way up where our, our apoapsis is pretty high. So we have plenty of time to try to get ourselves maneuvered over and throttle up, even though it's a little shaky, I have to throttle back down to half power here, but we are going. We're three degrees off our proper inclination. However, we can get that back on the right inclination. Three degrees is not a huge distance to make up. I think there's plenty, plenty, plenty of fuel in that lower stage. Plus I have a new special space tug because I want to be able to decouple that lower stage and then uh, let it go and finish the docking up on that space tug, which looks like a little bit like a frigate space tug, if you ask me, because those tanks come from the AIES mod. And I think they modeled them after that uh, particular kind of space tug or uh, orbital insertion stage or whatever you want to call it. Joseph, Valentina, are you two in here? I'm just saying, I, I don't think this is getting us anywhere. I mean, what do we do now? We could send it to the moon and put it at the same place where we found the statue that looks like it, back in our curbin, and just see what happens. Aha! Here you are! What's this? Oh, this? It's a lander built to look like that one that we saw from that alternate dimension. We thought maybe if we could send it to Mun and if we put it at that same location where- Computer, turn off that damn noise! Computer, what is that alarm all about? Massive anomaly surge detected. Well, put it on screen then. Joseph, are you seeing this? Yeah, I'm seeing it. Well, what is going on? Ah, uh, looks like a whole bunch of anomalies opened up and there's all kinds of asteroids or something coming through. They're heading straight for Kerbin. Krantz, is that you? Hadfield? We thought you were dead. I'm not dead. I'm at around the moon still. <laughs> Grants, what's going on? Joseph, what just happened to Hadfield? I, I don't know. I think there's something about the anomalies. I, oh, he went into a temporal anomaly. We thought he was dead, but he's actually still alive, and I think he just went back in again. That means we can actually rescue him. All we need to do is figure out when he's going to come back out again. You see, every time he's inside the anomaly, time is traveling slower for him. Begin computer lock. A massive anomaly surge has sent dozens of asteroids coming this way. Kessel and Joseph are analyzing the data, but we fear a large enough asteroid could destroy this Kerbin before we can get off of it and get to Duna. We may need to come up with some sort of way to redirect anything that's big enough. 
Also, the fuel shortage is getting worse. We really need to start mining and converting the cathane Kessla discovered. Valentina and Joseph are still working on a drill and containment unit. And finally, Hadfield is still alive somehow. Something to do with temporal anomalies, but only Joseph really seems to understand what's going on with them. He thinks we can predict where and when Hadfield will return again, and maybe we can get there to rescue him before it's too late. Well now, the list of things that need to be done is growing at an impressive rate. It's getting right back to the same th way that things were when I was doing Project Gateway, where every single episode I'm wondering, hmm, I wonder if I'll have enough to show in this particular one, and then by the time I'm done making it, I have way too much, and I don't know what I'm going to cut down on in order to put into the next episode so that I can actually keep the one that I'm making at a reasonable length. So anyway, getting back here to the actual launch, you can see that we have just finished up getting into the proper orbit and we just need to now decouple after activating that antenna right there, decouple that lower stage and now flip this thing around so that we can come at it from the side, deorbit that lower stage there and, uh, and then get back to that uh, what are we calling this? This is our airlock. We don't have a name for this one either, so I need to come up with this. The Quest airlock was the one that went up to the ISS. This one, well, I'll just call it the Odyssey airlock for now. So we're going to come in and we're going to attach this from that docking port that's actually on the side of it. This is the first time I've ever actually tried docking anything from the side. And it is going to turn out to be a little bit challenging. Uh, right here, this one, it looks like I'm coming in close, but this is actually on purpose. I aimed for the back here and I went around the side of it and then I rolled it over and uh, then tried to come in on it. And you can see that docking port right there. We're activating it there. Now we're all set up. And even though I'm using this Navy Fish docking alignment indicator, it still ended up being a very, very challenging docking. I had to, after I roll this around, I had to very slowly ease it in. And every time I made any kind of adjustment, even though back in the vehicle assembly building, the RCS build aid had said that it was all balanced, uh, all of the moves I make here make it shift in strange directions and keep on rolling. So like I, I overcorrect constantly. This whole part right here that you're watching, this is sped up to 10 times normal speed. So if it looks like it's taking like two or three minutes to get this in, uh, that is because in real life it was taking 20 or 30 minutes to get this lined up and put in there. And even then, once I finally did get it lined up, I tried to have it rolled to the right angle. But the magnets on those two parts grabbed each other and pulled it in too fast for me to actually stop it from going in at a slightly crooked angle. So unfortunately, it is off just a tiny bit, just a few millimeters there, but it is noticeable by me that, that it is off. Anyway, we have decoupled our sort of frigate-like simulated uh, final tug there, and now we can take that one and send that one back to curb. And there's no way for me to reuse that one because uh, that's just a regular decoupler on there. See, just slightly off, just a little bit crooked. Anyway, now we have a bunch of things we need to get to. We, If we're going to go to the moon and test out our new uh, cathane drill, we're going to need to put up a new cathane, well, not a cathane scanner. Uh, we already have a, a cathane scan. No, we do. We do need a cathane scanner. We didn't do that at the moon yet. We need a cathane scanner at the moon and we need to have some remote tech communications to talk to that scanner while it's around the moon. So step one in that process is right here. We're going to launch a new uh, remote tech communication satellite that's supposed to go and be not actually around the moon. It's in an orbit, it's going to be in an orbit around Kerbin that's a little bit ahead on the exact same orbit with the moon. Effectively, if you've ever heard of a Lagrange point, it's going to be at what's known as L4. 
in the Lagrange system. There's also an L5 that I'm going to launch soon. Uh, I will show you when we're out on the map what that means, but basically what it means is it's just going to stay ahead in the orbit on the moon, pointing a satellite dish back at that one whole side of the moon. And then by putting the other one on the other side, which we were calling L5, we're going to put it a satellite dish that points at that side of the moon and that's going to completely cover pretty much both sides and most of the backside. I really don't think we're going to have to worry about losing communication on the backside because we won't be going low enough down to the surface to actually have it fall out of that communications. You can see we've deployed everything here. The solar panels are out. The two can dishes are out, the antennas out, and we're making our way up to the moon orbit now. The reason I'm going way higher than the orbit there is I want to be able to time it so that when we come back down off of our apoapsis and hit that node there, see how I have that close approach marker? It lets me see how close we're going to be relative to the moon because I want to get it here and be in front, like I said. Now, before we get back to that, we had already set one of the dishes on that uh, moon data relay satellite to point back toward Kerbin, but right now nothing is pointing up toward it. The other satellites are pointing at the moon. We needed to set something to point directly at this satellite because it's so far away from the moon right now. Now, we have our orbit. It is around close there, but we're going to slow down relative to the moon here so that the moon catches up a bit. However, I don't want to get to where I'm in the SO and that's why you see me now where I'm coming up and the moon is right behind us so I'm pulling the orbit down to bring myself down to hit the orbit right there and now if we circularize and get the exact same orbital period that the moon has we will be sitting directly in front of it like I described earlier and the moon will be chasing us but it'll never catch up because we have the same period so now we're orbiting at the exact same rate that the moon is now in the real world that's a Lagrange point and there's a little bit more to it than uh, the, what I'm doing here, but Kerbal has only a single body physics system. So essentially, I'm just in the same orbit. But in the real world, a Lagrange point's a little more complicated. So you can see right there, communications is now linked up, even though it's making a lot of hops. So we need our second satellite that's going to go to the L5 position. L4 is in front of the moon and L5 is the one that's going to be behind it. And by pointing at the two sides, now hopefully you're seeing what I was talking about where it's gonna provide that communication on both sides of it while only needing two satellites instead of three. A lot of times you might see people wanna put a network around the moon where they'll put three so that at all times there's something that can communicate back to Kerbin. But uh, you don't really need that if you just get them out on the same orbit there, you can do it with two. So we're launching this second one. It is an exact replica of the other. It has the one antenna, the multiple CPUs to control the different things. It has the two solar panels, two dishes that are symmetrically attached. The two dishes, one of them will point back to Kerbin. One of them will point to the other moon relay satellite. That way, just in case, there's always something that will be able to talk there based on whatever the angles might be of the tracking and data relay satellites that are down around Kerbin that point to the moon. You see the remote tech, the way you can hook the satellites up is you can have a satellite point directly at another satellite or you can have it point toward a body like the moon and it'll pick up anything that happens to be in that area. Now here, I was trying to get behind the moon. So I thought that if I went really high up above the moon, see how I'm coming back behind it right here? And I thought, oh, well, I'll just do this and then I'll shift the orbit and we'll just kind of catch back up from underneath. But then I had a little problem here where we accidentally went back into the SOI. So I backed off just a little bit more. And then I thought, okay, now I just need to let it lag behind just a little bit and oh, damn it, it's getting caught again by the SOI. So I got too close, so we pulled back yet again, and then I got too far under. I was going faster because I had the lower orbit. I actually want to uh, let it go slow down so I end up even more behind the planet. And once again, it goes by and I miss it. It's a good thing we have a lot of fuel on this because again, right here you can see I'm making sure my so solar panels are pointing toward the sun because I noticed that my energy was going down. But it's a little good thing that we have all all that fuel 
on there because it took all these multiple tries to get myself lined up with behind the moon. I kept, it's really easy apparently to get in front, but for whatever reason, I was having a challenging time getting behind it. Finally, I get behind it right here, and so now all I need to do is finally line that orbital period up. Uh, again, playing this little game of whoops, I'm going to be intercepting, I don't want to do that, so I back it off, go a little bit more, do another little burst. Finally, the orbital period is the same as the moon's. You can see the one hour, 14 minutes, 36 no, four, one, one day, 14 hours, something like 36 minutes and 20, I don't remember, but you can see it up there in my MechJab window. Anyway, now you can see there we were finally hooked up with our two on the both sides there, and we have our communications ready to go. So now we can send our Cathane scanner up to the moon. Yes, indeed, we do need to send that, but we're not sending it just yet. You didn't think this was that launch, did you? No, 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 no. This launch right here is going to be uh, Bill. He's taking a crew up to our new space station. We figure that it's time to actually get some people up there, well, some Kerbals up there. We need to get Kesla so that he can start doing some analysis of the scientific instruments and just the stuff all around this new Kerbin that we're on right here. Before this launch, I was actually thinking that maybe we wouldn't send them up yet, that I would get some extra power on there, uh, maybe some truss segments and some uh, extra solar panels so that we could make sure that we didn't have any power issues. But then it occurred to me, or maybe appropriately it occurred to like Joseph or Krantz, right? Because technically they're the ones coming up with all this stuff. Uh, but it, it occurred to somebody that if we were up there and we had some kind of issue with the power, well, we do have this escape capsule. This Hydra 2 that we're launching right here is going to act as the escape capsule. Should anything go wrong at the station, should we find out that we actually need more life support or something. So if we just get this up there, dock it up, let them get in there and start doing their work, then we'll start having all of the information that we need in order to analyze all this stuff to, that we're going to need for Duna here uh, a little sooner. So we'll bring up trust segments in some future episode. And actually, we're not going to finish docking this one even in this episode. Instead, we're going to go back down to the surface and now we're launching the Cathane scanning satellite that's supposed to go to the moon. This one is loaded up there in the top of that fairing uh, on top of a uh, Minotaur smaller stage. So we got the big huge fairing on there on just one regular core lower stage, but I needed to go with the slightly larger fairing because it turned out that the satellite itself was just a little bit too big for that 1.25, even an extended KW rocketry fairing. Anyway, with those two communication satellites that are now way over at the moon, we should be able to put this into a polar orbit going over the surface, scanning it for cathane, scanning it for biomes and elevation changes, anomalies, you name it, whatever it is, we're going to find it because we've got a bunch of scientific instruments on this thing. The one that we launched over Kerbin into the polar orbit here has been going around and doing all of its scans, and so it looks like we're getting all the information we need here. It's time to have this one over at the moon because what we want is to find out what's a good landing spot to start doing our reference missions. Remember, a reference mission is one where if you want to go, say, land on Mars in the real world, you practice on our moon here at Earth first. Likewise, we're going to go to Duna, but we're going to practice practice here on the moon before we go to Duna and find out that we have some sort of flaw in any one of our designs. We'll make tweaks down here and that way you know, obviously nothing can go wrong. So there you can see the fairing has opened up and away goes the lower stage, the 2.5 meter one, and there's that satellite. We're going to open that up way back here. We'll get our solar panels out first and then we're going to open that up like a little blooming flower activate those communication systems. We have an antenna and a dish. We're going to point that dish back at Kerbin, which should pick up any one of the satellites that's around Kerbin, there's three of them now, that are all pointing their dishes over at the moon. Meanwhile, you can see right here, we have those other two with their antenna that are over at L4 and L5. 
and they're going to provide communication through their antenna to our antenna in the event that perhaps we were to need to turn off our dish for power savings or if the dish were to fail or anything like that. Well, we're actually going to finish getting this to Moon in the next episode, and we're also going to dock up with the space station and take care of a few other things that we need to do around Kerbin to continue this odyssey to get ourselves home. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts. Thank you.